Thanks to the Hatfield and McCoy families of Eastern Kentucky and Southwestern West Virginia, feuding has become synonymous with Appalachia. Those two clans may have gotten the lion's share of the media's attention, but they weren't the only feudist in these mountains. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and today we're going to be telling the story of a famous mountain feud that doesn't involve either a Hatfield or a McCoy. This is Stories, A History of Appalachia. You know, Steve, as always, another great story comes out, and we're not talking about the Hatfields or McCoys. We're talking about some of the other feuds that went on back here in rural Appalachia during the day that didn't get a lot of press out of them because the Hatfields and McCoys really stole all the thunder from everybody else. Well, this is a very well-known story in central and southern Appalachia, mm-hmm. but not on the national scene. Again, yeah, right. the Hatfields and the McCoys, they, well, especially uh, Devil Ants was a master at media manipulation. Mm-hmm. So that's what folks think of when they think of feud in Appalachia, Hatfields and McCoys. Mm-hmm. In the late 1880s and early 1890s, newspapers around the country became quite fascinated with Appalachian blood feuds and were constantly reporting about them. And the most well-known of these feuds, as we said, was between the Hatfields and the McCoys. But there was another one that kind of rivaled that family war in the papers, at least in this part of the country. Mm-hmm. The French Eversol feud in Perry County, Kentucky. Joseph Eversall and Benjamin French were both merchants and lawyers in the county seat of Hazard, which got its name in a most interesting way. It seems that the founder of Perry County, Elijah H. Combs, named both the town of Hazard and Perry County after a hero in the War of 1812, General Oliver Hazard Perry. Speaking of Elijah Combs, here is where the family relationships of the Eversalls and the French got entangled in the history of Perry County. Jacob Eversall's great-grandson was the aforementioned Joseph, who married the great-granddaughter of Elijah Combs, and whose father was the local judge, Josiah Henry Combs, who we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Mr. French, on the other hand, was a relative newcomer to town, having moved there from Tennessee. He married a Kentucky woman, Susan Lewis, and through her was related to prominent families in Breathitt and Leslie County. Now, from the start of the feud in 1886 until it pretty much ended in 1894, it's believed, Steve, that between 40 to 70 people died in that particular feud. There was some talk in the newspapers at the time that the cause of the war involved a woman with whom a clerk in Benjamin French's store was in love. The story goes that one day this clerk saw the young lady talking to his boss, making him insanely jealous. The clerk then goes to Joseph Eversall and tells him that he heard Mr. French threaten to kill Mr. Eversall, prompting Eversall to gather his clan, armed to the teeth, around him for protection. Well, that's an interesting story. The real reason is a lot more practical, involving coal and the right to mine coal. You see, the 1880s saw the rise of the coal barons around Appalachia. French was working for a company set up to take control of the coal under the hills of eastern Kentucky by buying subsurface coal rights from the often illiterate farmers who scratched out a living subsistence farming, promising them they could keep the surface of the land if they just put their X on the broad form deed that French provided and allow the coal company to go underground to pull out that coal. Mr. Eversoll, on the other hand, wanted to make sure that longtime residents of Perry County were protected, especially since he was related to most of them. So you had Benjamin French trying to get mineral rights for bottom dollar for the coal company, and Joseph Eversoll angered by what he saw as taking advantage of illiterate mountain folk. And Rod, that led to conflict. It sure did, Steve. As Eversoll traveled across the county, telling the farmers to beware of Benjamin French, that he was trying to cheat them out of their coal rights, as he would put it. Eversall and French began raising armies, with French using coal company funds, reportedly paying his men $2 to $2.50 a day. The first to die in the feud was one of Benjamin French's friends, Silas Gayhart, reportedly killed by a dozen whites and a handful of blacks, who ambushed him. 
French blamed Joseph Eversall, but Eversall denied any involvement in Gayhart's death. Through the summer of 1887, there were sporadic cat and mouse fights between the two sides. For example, one night French left Hazard to gather more forces for an attack on Eversall and his men. Eversall promptly left Hazard, leaving just a few men in the town as a trap, and then waited outside of town for the French forces to make their return. Mr. French suspected this, so he didn't re-enter the town until June of 1887, at which time the two men met and had a shootout, resulting in one injury on the French side and French's withdrawal from Hazard. As the summer went on, the cost of maintaining private armies became too much for the two men, so they met at Big Creek and signed a peace treaty, which provided for both to return home and disband their armies but did not resolve the basic differences between the two men. Things broke down later that summer when French accused Eversall of taking his guns back from his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs. Eversall denied that he had ever even given his guns to the judge, that he hadn't disbanded his army, and that the treaty only called for a partial surrender of arms. And at that, the war was back on. On September 15, 1887, Joseph Eversall got into an argument with Bill Gambrill, one of Benjamin French's friends and supporters, who was an itinerant preacher in downtown Hazard. The argument escalated into a fist fight, which caused some of Eversall's men to pull out their guns and shoot at Gambrill, wounding him. Figuring he probably ought to get out of there while he could, Bill Gambrill started making his escape when another man shot him, and then Joseph Eversall pulled his pistol out and coolly shot Gambrill in the head, instantly taking his life. One of the men who shot Gambrill was tried for murder, but was eventually acquitted. Eversall wasn't arrested or charged because witnesses said that Gambrill had attacked him first. An uneasy calm came over Perry County for the rest of that fall and winter. The calm was broken, though, on April 15, 1888, when Joe Eversall was accompanying his brother-in-law, Nick Combs, and his father-in-law, the good judge Josiah Combs, to Hyden for the regular term of the circuit court. Also in the party was a policeman, Tom Hollyfield, who was transporting a prisoner to Hyden to face trial. It was at that time that Bad Tom Smith, one of French's hired thugs, and Joseph Adkins ambushed the group, killing Eversall and seriously wounding Nick Combs. At the time, nobody knew that Smith was involved. It came out, though, much later when Bad Tom was convicted and sentenced to hang for another murder. He confessed on the gallows that he and Adkins had killed the men and that he had come out into the road and found Nick Combs still alive. Combs begged Smith not to shoot him again, and Smith then shot his eyes out, whoa, finishing him off. Bad Tom said his motive for revenge was for a prosecution for horse thievery and on orders from French. After Joe Eversall's murder, John Campbell took the reins for the Eversall side. Campbell surrounded Hazard with guards and set up street patrols. Things were so tense that he only let people into town who knew a password that he set up. Unfortunately, this tension led to his death as one night Campbell came upon a sleeping guard. When he tried to wake him, the startled man pointed his gun at Campbell and shot him. John Campbell died a month later from the wound. On October 9, 1888, another son-in-law of Judge Combs, Elijah Morgan, a French supporter, was ambushed and killed when he was lured to a meeting on a promise to talk peace some say in retaliation for the ambush murder of an Eversall man, Shade Combs. By this time, the authorities had pretty much had enough. The new Perry County Circuit Court judge, Judge Lilly, wrote to the governor of Kentucky asking for troops to be sent to the area so that he could safely hold court and regain some type of authority. The governor sent troops to Hazard on November 14th, 1888, headed by Sam Hill. Yeah, you know, the, <laughs> what the Sam Hill that old folks used to say. <laughs> anyway, according to Hill's report to the governor, only 35 people remained in Hazard, the rest having fled the violence. With troops present, the November term of court went smoothly. So smoothly, in fact, that the governor ordered their removal at the end of the November term, 
and that the home guards could suppress disorder just fine. Never mind that the home guards consisted of the very men who were involved in the feud. And at that, the good Judge Lilly, well, he was a man of common sense. He took his leave of Eastern Kentucky, failing to appear for the November 1889 term of the circuit court, resulting in an election for a special judge and setting the scene for the Battle of Hazard. Well, Steve, on the fourth day of the court term, a drunk by the name of Campbell was on Graveyard Hill in Hazard, playing cards with some friends, and in high spirits, he just started shooting his gun. A storekeeper saw him shooting, so he got his own gun, and he took aim, and he killed Campbell with one shot. That shot rang out and was heard in the courthouse. The people inside, thinking the feud was on again, ran for cover. The Eversall clan took control of the courthouse and the French clan captured the jailhouse. Two Frenchmen, Jesse Fields and Bob Prophet, were in a jury room on the second floor and they realized they had better get out of there before the Eversall men found them. That the only way out was to jump out of a window, which they instantly did once the Eversall clan started to break the door down to the jury room. They made it to the ground safely, but it wasn't over for them as the Eversols began firing on them from the second floor jury room as the two ran for their lives to the safety of the jailhouse and their French compatriots. Fire was exchanged all the rest of the day between the courthouse and the jailhouse. That night, Fields and Prophet, along with Bad Tom Smith, who was set free, took off with the rest of the French clan to higher ground to regroup. In the end, Jay McKnight, an Eversall man, was shot and killed by French's forces, and when their ammo was gone, the rest of the Eversalls retreated across the river, leaving one man with a rifle to cover them. Fields and Smith chased after them. The Eversall rifleman shot wounded Fields, and the battle was done. Well, in July 1890, things finally came to a head when Robin Cornett, an Eversall supporter, returned home hoping to be done with the feuding and was ambushed and killed in the woods near his home. That did it for Judge Lilly, who, by the way, had decided to return to take charge of the Perry County Courts. At a special August 1890 term held in a tent because, yeah, you guessed it, the courthouse had been burned to the ground on the 4th of July, uh, oh the judge, flanked by state troops, brought up each of the Eversall and French men on charges and sent them to Clark County for trial. This term, called the Blanket Court, worked to finally bring an end to the worst of the violence. With things finally calmed down, Judge Josiah Combs made his return to Hazard. Not long after returning, Combs was ambushed and killed while meeting with friends outside of his home. It seems that there was a large cornfield near the house, and Joe Atkins, Jesse Fields, and Boone Frazier hid there waiting for the judge to make his appearance. They then made their escape undiscovered. That is, until Bad Tom Smith went to the gallows and implicated them in that murder as well, along with Fulton French. In the end, French was acquitted, Frazier was never caught, and Fields initially sentenced to life, but later acquitted in a second trial, and Atkins getting life. But he was pardoned after eight years. The whole mess came to an end in 1913. A chance encounter between Fulton French and Susan Eversall, widow of Joe, and Susan and Joe's son, Harry, well, it didn't go so well for French. After saying good morning to the widow, Harry pulled out a pistol and shot French in the spleen, causing him to eventually die from the wound a little over a year later. For that, Harry got a $75 fine for disturbing the peace. Wow. And that ended the Eversall French feud. Hmm. How about that, Rod? I'm. I won't tell you. I mean, the the one with Hatfields and McCoys. There was a difference of philosophy, so to speak. There was a difference in terms, and some of this went back, of course, to the Civil War. Just different things like that. But this feud, entirely, almost more than anything else, political power or power, being able to run, do things, and be able to do the things that they wanted to do each side, so to speak, and then both of them at one point or another wanting to end the feud, but somebody else restarting the feud because 
things hadn't been settled yet. That seems like what the whole story of this is all about. You know, you make a good point on that. The, the Hatfields and McCoys basically was the Civil War continuing to be fought mm-hmm. between Confederates and, and Union people. This was all about coal. Yeah. Coal, coal mining, the power and the money that came from that versus what damage it would do to just ordinary people. At least it started out that way, and then it just turned into one fine mess. And you said 40 to 70 people. That's a number that's kind of up there. Nobody really knows how many were actually killed out of this whole thing, but 40 to 70, that's that's a pretty wide gap there. But still, that was how many people were killed eventually in this whole feud. And folks, that's the story of one of Eastern Kentucky's most notorious feuds between the Eversols and the Frenches. Another story in the history of Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the Stories Podcast in many ways. Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, Good Pods, Radio Public, Odyssey, Audible, or on your favorite podcast app. And thanks for listening. Till next we meet. So long, everybody. So long.